Alicia, this is uh, over many of the papers this morning, front page of the Daily Telegraph. Rishi Sunak very much on the front foot, trying to capture the public's imagination. And he thinks this is a vote winner. He does, and this is something the Conservative Party have been really trying to bring into their remit for quite some time now. It's just a month after the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, came under quite a lot of fire for basically saying that lots of people who were just struggling with the everyday challenges of life were potentially saying they had depression and mental health problems. He came um, under a lot of fire for that, but this is very much another rung of the same ladder for the Conservative Party. It's all about productivity, it's all about getting people back into work and weaning people away from what they say is an overly generous benefit system. Uh, it all comes down to the details, as always, mm. though, uh, James, doesn't it? Uh, we don't really know the specifics of how this is actually going to work. We don't. What, what's being kind of trailed in the papers this morning is this idea that sick notes, as opposed to being prescribed by a GP, may be given out by specialist assessors instead. Yeah. There is a suggestion that GPs, it's too easy maybe for a GP to think. If someone comes to you and they're complaining about problems with their mental health, for example, to go, OK, I'll sign you off work. And actually, is there a better way of doing those assessments? But you're right, we need to see the details later from Rishi mm. Sunak. But clearly, if you look at how the out-of-work benefits bill has risen over the past 10 years, you know, we now spend more on out-of-work benefits than we do on schools, for instance. The government, at a time when there that's is a, a pretty huge... That's maker, huge. Isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. a huge amount of money. Mm. At a time when the government is looking at ways to save money, you know, particularly with potentially a manifesto commitment coming to increase defence spending, well, how are you going to pay for that? You can mm. pay for it one of three ways. You raise taxes. The Tories don't want to do that because already the tax burden's incredibly high. Borrowing. No government really at the moment wants to commit to more borrowing. Or you have to reduce spending elsewhere. And there is a sense in the Conservative Party, at least, that the welfare budget is somewhere they can look to make savings. And, Alicia, this comes on the back, of course, of dire polling results for the Conservative Party. Rishi Sunak really hoping that this was going to be a golden nugget for him. But when you look at the latest polling, this is Ipsos uh, for the Evening Standard, this is a 25-point lead for Labour. The Conservatives at their lowest since, what, 1978? It's really interesting. And every time there's another really bad poll for the Conservatives, which there have just been a strew of and they seem to be getting worse, I feel like we all keep saying, you know, is is this going to turn it around? Is this going to be the thing that suddenly changes their fate? And it just seems that it, it's just too late for that, really. It seems that lots of people have made their mind up about this Conservative government and have decided that it's it's not what they want um, come the next general election. And that poll definitely proves that sentiment in the country. And with this announcement, the Prime Minister trying to get on the front foot, as we said, and away from the less palatable headlines mm. that they're currently enjoying, not least of all, uh, about Tory MP Mark Menzies. Really interesting story and, and, and quite a strange story as well. It's a situation where an MP has ended up in a situation where he has potentially been compromised and then what seems like blackmail afterwards. And it does seem like there is a bit of a parallel there with the Westminster honey trap story that we heard matter of weeks ago, maybe even last week, I can't remember, it's all blurry into one. <laughs> um, but it, it's these situations where MPs are ending up in compromising positions and mm. then effectively being blackmailed at the end of it. And obviously, Mark Menzies denies all of these allegations totally and says that he didn't use party funds. But what he hasn't denied is being in a situation that is a bit odd, effectively. He said that he was lock, locked in a flat and then found that he, he emergency needed five grand to get himself out of flat. I mean, That's how do you end up in, in that situation? That's the dubious part of this. And, and James, for Rishi Sunak, he must think, here we go again, yet yeah. another story. I'm trying so hard to actually control the political narrative, and yet his members of parliament seem to be letting him down. Well, Rishi Sunak will be banging his head against a brick wall because the government actually have had some positive economic data this week. Inflation has fallen. That is what we should be talking about. And yet, here we are talking about another Conservative MP in the headlines for the wrong reasons. We've had Liz Truss dominating proceedings this week with her new book as well, so we can't escape the shadow of his predecessor. Every time the government tries to tell a positive story, something else crops up. Yeah, and, and it does keep cropping up because I think we were talking in the last hour, there are... 18 independent MPs yeah. uh, currently sitting who are there for one reason or another, but various misdemeanours. They're not all Tories, but predominantly this feels like it's affecting the Tories. It does. It's just been a wipeout of Conservative MPs and um, between the last election and now. I mean, the numbers are dwindling massively. Um, and obviously with Will Ragg, for example, obviously the Westminster honey trap story impacting him, mm. he chose to resign the whip. But that's not the case 
all the time. Often it's getting to a situation where an MP is having the Conservative title forcibly taken away from them. And not just Conservative MPs, it's important to stress, but the majority of them are at the moment. And, and it's interesting, isn't it, James? No-one's talking about Angela Rayner today. We've been talking about her for the last few weeks and we're all focusing back on the Conservative Party as well. Just in terms of, of Rishi Sunak, mm -hmm. does he go now? Does he just say, after the local elections in two weeks' time, and who knows what the results are, does he just say, we go to the electorate now? Or is it a case of the party will go to him and say, you're off. Well, I have always thought that if you're Rishi Sunak, you may as well spend that much longer in Downing Street because, you know, if it's your lifetime ambition to be Prime Minister, why would you end your time six months so early? He might as well. <laughs> and also, it. you know, you're going to lose terribly now. You may not lose as bad in six months' time because who knows what may happen. Yeah. But I think the interesting thing is, if the local election results are so bad for the Conservatives that Rishi Sunak fears a plot to oust him, he may decide in that moment of sort of defensiveness to call an election then, but I still think we're looking at the autumn. And also there's more polling out, isn't there, saying that actually a change of leader wouldn't actually change the fortunes of the Conservative Party. So it's not actually about Rishi Sunak. Is it actually it's time? And the country often does this, doesn't it? It goes through cyclical changes. It's interesting because Rishi Sunak is not a popular Conservative Party leader at all. I mean, we keep hearing polls saying that, that, that he's at the level of where Liz Truss was when things went pretty badly after that mini-budget. And, and obviously her polling was, was pretty low then. So he's not super popular. However, However, there are lots of people who definitely don't think he should be the Prime Minister, definitely don't support him, but still think that having another change of leader before an election would send a worse signal to the public. The Ipsos poll we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier also found that Keir Starmer's personal poll ratings have fallen to the lowest since he became Labour leader. That's not yeah. good timing for him. And, and this is the interesting thing. A lot of people are comparing where we are now with 1997 because mm -hmm. they think there could be a big Labour landslide coming. The big difference there is that actually, A, because of the economy, there was more of a feel-good factor in Britain mm -hmm. generally. And also, Tony Blair was personally very popular in a way that Keir Starmer just isn't. If he does win a big majority next time round, it won't so much be a vote for the Labour Party and Keir Starmer, it'll probably be a vote against the Conservative Party. And that's what we're also hearing from people when they're asked how they're going to vote. About 47% say they have decided how to vote. The other 50% or thereabouts actually don't know how they'll vote. Yeah. Why hasn't Keir Starmer got that cut through? What is it about him that the public just don't seem to get? Well, look, he's not necessarily the world's most charismatic performer, orator. He would try and sell himself as a kind of steady, stable leader, almost in a kind of Theresa May mould. But I was then we. Say, I've heard that before. Exactly. Look, <laughs> yeah. look how that Strong. turned out. Yeah. You know, some would say that given the pyrotechnics of the Boris Johnson years and then Liz Truss's very brief stint in Downing Street, maybe a bit of stability is what we need. But that also is Rishi Sunak's appeal. That's how he tried to sell himself. The grown ups are back in charge. And people have had 18 months of Rishi Sunak in Downing Street or thereabouts, and they think, well, actually, maybe we want a few pyrotechnics. So it's difficult, isn't it? People always yearn for, for the other thing. When you, get a, Boris Johnson, yes. when you get a Boris Johnson type figure, people go, oh, can't we have someone a bit dull and competent? And then you get someone <laughs> dull and competent, people go, oh, can't we have someone exciting again? Uh, on the subject of the grass is always greener. The European Commission proposing uh, changing some... An olive branch post-Brexit mm. to allow some young people under 30s to be able to go and spend time in an EU country. Yes, this was because in the wake of Brexit, obviously the free movement um, agreement that we had with EU countries was obviously uh, collapsed in the wake of Brexit. Mm. And it's, it now means it's really quite difficult for people to work abroad um, in a way that it wasn't so difficult before Brexit. So this is definitely an olive branch from the EU trying to say that we, we want a little bit of what we had before without having any of the, the kind of formalities. Oh, so now they want to play nicely, <laughs> do they? James, ju just in terms of mm -hmm. that, the EU is saying, oh, well, we can do a deal with the United Kingdom. What does that do for Starmer? Because the UK government is saying, actually, we already do deals with young people yeah. from other countries and we're not going to negotiate with the EU as a whole. Now, Starmer is in a tricky place here yeah. because if he says, yes, we embrace the EU, that shows his colours, doesn't it? He doesn't want the issue of the EU to crop up at <laughs> all in the election campaign. However, once the election is done, let's assume he wins and he's in Downing Street, there probably will be, over time, some shifts towards a little bit more cooperation with the EU. I'm not saying, for example, he's going to turn around and say we're going to mm. join the customs union suddenly, but you never know. That could be the long-term direction of travel. Mm.
it's fascinating, isn't it, just in terms of, of how this is morphing. Would you agree with that, that actually the last thing that Starmer wants is yeah. any mention of the EU at all before we get to polling day? Definitely, because for so long, I mean, people will remember, if, for, if HC campaigned, obviously, to, to rejoin the EU slash remain in the EU at the time, and then suddenly was like, oh, no, no, we don't want to rejoin the EU, we're fine, we're going we're gonna to carry on as is. And then it had lots of people questioning what his actual belief on it was. Mm. So he really tried to quiet that for so long. Um, uh, but it's definitely going to keep cropping up. And, of I course, mean, we saw is. the NatCon conference, didn't we? Disrupted, of course, other noises off from the, um, from the Conservative Party as well. So Rishi Sunak not having a great time, nor Starmer at the moment. Uh, Alicia, James, thank you both very much indeed.